Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the disestablishment ceremony for the Charleston Naval Shipyard, Charleston, South Carolina. After the introduction of the ceremony participants, there will be a 17-gun salute prior to the invocation. Will the guests please rise and remain standing until after the invocation? <laughs> Naval Shipyard, Charleston, arriving. Naval Shipyard and Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Conversion and Repair Management and Field Activity Support, arriving. <phone rings> Naval Base, Charleston, arriving. <phone rings> Vice Commander, Naval Sea Systems Command, arriving. Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy, arriving. <phone rings> Lieutenant Governor for the State of South Carolina, arriving. <phone rings> Nuclear Propulsion, arriving. Parade the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem.
post the callers. Lieutenant Curtis Price, Chaplain Corps, will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, creator of the seven seas, the continents of the world, and all that lie therein, we give thanks this day for your provincial power and your abundant grace. We ask your blessings on this event as we gather to recognize the countless men and women who have sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears to make the Charleston Navy shipyard a legend for all time. As we reflect on their decades of service, we are grateful for their abiding faith and commitment to you, our God, to this nation, and to the sea services. Allow each of them to know the satisfaction that comes from faithful service and a job well done. Guide and sustain them through the continuing transitions that lie ahead to the end that they may continue in service to you and your people. Almighty God, help us to remember and never forget the seafaring tradition that gave birth to this shipyard at the turn of the century. And on this day, as we celebrate a dividend of our nation's role in making world peace, guard the future resolve of our entire community, that as the need arises, Charleston stands ready to reclaim its portion in making and keeping that peace. Move each of us to rededicate ourselves to our nation, to our Navy, and to you, our God, to the end that the United States of America might be a bright beacon of light and hope for our world, especially as we proceed through the sometimes stormy and confused seas of this age. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Will the guests please be seated? <laughs> Captain William F. Nold. Commander, Charleston Naval Shipyard. Good morning. Admiral DeMars, Lieutenant Governor Peeler, Secretary Cassidy, Admiral McGinley, Admiral Watkins, Admiral Porter, Congressman Sanford, General Westmoreland, General Velger, former Congressman Ravenel, Mayor Summey, other distinguished state and local officials, Admiral Bachoco, Admiral Emerson, Admiral Flatley, Admiral Clayman, Admiral Westfall, Admiral Horn, prior shipyard commanders, Admiral Camacho, Admiral Hines, Captain Mahoney, Captain Fenton, fellow commanding officers, members of the El Mendel Rivers family, other distinguished guests, employees, friends, and families of Charleston Naval Shipyard. If you look skyward, you will see a special flyover of the C-17 Globemaster III aircraft. What a magnificent airplane. This flyover represents the Air Force's salute to the men and women of Charleston Naval Shipyard. I might add, it also symbolizes that although the shipyard and the major fleet Navy presence of Charleston is leaving Charleston, a strong military presence will remain in the form of Charleston Air Force Base and as well as the Naval Weapons Station at Goose Creek. I would like to thank Brigadier General Gary Velger, Commander, 437th Air Wing Lift, for this salute. Thank you, General. Thank you all for joining us today as we commemorate the 95 years of service of Charleston Naval Shipyard. Our official closing date is still two weeks away on 1 April. However, we chose to hold our disestablishment ceremony today because, frankly, I do not believe we would have the fortitude to hold it in two weeks. You see, this is not a happy occasion for us. Rather, it is an event that we have been dreading for nearly three years. 
When Charleston Naval Shipyard was placed on the list of recommended facilities for closure in BRAC 93, a wave of disbelief and shock swept through this yard, this base, and this community. How could this happen? What have we done to deserve this? And what can be done to take Charleston off the list? Indeed, a very strong and valiant effort was put together by the employees of this yard and the cities of the Tri-County area to fight the closure of the shipyard and naval base. Many of you here today were involved in this effort. Although unsuccessful, we know that it was an honest, hard-fought battle with the right arguments and the data to win, and we thank you for that effort. It meant a lot to us that you fought so hard to keep us alive. We also know that Charleston Naval Shipyard was closed not because we didn't do our job, but rather because we did our job so well. The fall of the Iron Curtain, the victory in the Persian Gulf War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the closure of this shipyard are all the result of the unquestioned superiority of the United States Navy and the military forces of the United States of America, a superiority that Charleston Naval Shipyard worked for, contributed to, and achieved through 95 years of service to this country. The freedom that we enjoy as Americans has been made possible by this effort. Each and every one of you who have been a part of this shipyard can be proud of that contribution. Closing has been the hardest task this shipyard has ever undertaken. Hard, not from a technical viewpoint, because certainly after building and repairing warships and refueling nuclear-powered submarines, closure by no means equals those technical challenges, but hard from an emotional viewpoint. Charleston Naval Shipyard is more than just a job to its employees. It was a family. To close it down has been like destroying the family homestead. Those of us in uniform who only get to spend a small part of our careers here will never be able to fully understand the emotional ties that bind the shipyard workers to each other and to the yard, nor will we be able to comprehend the heart-wrenching effort it has taken for them to close this facility down. But close it down they have done. With the same determination, dedication, and quality for which Charleston Naval Shipyard became noted, the men and women of this yard tackled this mission and completed it on schedule and significantly under cost. Concurrent with this closing, the shipyard has been actively working with those responsible for the redevelopment and reuse of the naval base and shipyard. It has not been easy to see what was once ours being turned over to new tenants, but we are proud to say that a good majority of the shipyard has already been leased to private industry. Again, this is a result of a lot of work by a lot of people. On reuse in general, I would like to say congratulations. Congratulations to the best committee headed by Mayor Summey for the reuse plan. To RDA number one, headed by Mr. Ron Coward, for the hard work and the foundations that were laid. And to the present RDA, headed first by former Congressman Arthur Avenel and presently by Mr. James Bryan, for the industry and the reuse you have already brought to this shipyard. I and the Navy wish you continued success. 21 months ago, when I first came to Charleston, I was asked if I was disappointed to be coming to a shipyard that was closing. At that time, I answered, definitely not. It was an honor and a privilege to be here. I would like to reemphasize that last part. It has been an honor and a privilege to have been a part, however small, of this great shipyard. I am sorry only in that I couldn't spend more time here with these fantastic men and women. I wish I had the time to announce the names of every person who is instrumental in making Charleston Naval Shipyard so special and in making the closure the success that it has been, but there are far too many. I will only say thank you. Thank you to those who started and completed that last ship availability under the toughest, toughest possible conditions. Thank you to those who kept, the, kept working with enthusiasm and dedication despite a personal unknown future. Thank you to those in Human Resources, the Transition Center, and the job clubs for giving your all to find jobs and provide help to your fellow employees. Thank you to those who kept the computers, services, and utilities running so the rest of us could do our jobs. And thank you to those who stayed just to ensure that we closed with dignity. You can be rightly proud of what you have accomplished. Charleston Naval Shipyard has closed with the quality, pride, and dignity that can only be found here. I cannot describe how proud I am of each and every one of you. 
thank you for allowing me to serve with you. It is now my pleasure to read a letter from the Honorable Strom Thurmond, Senator from the great state of South Carolina, who, we, who was unfortunately uh, was unable to attend today. Dear friends, today is a sad day for South Carolina as it marks the end of a long relationship between the people of our state and the United States Navy. For as long as anyone can remember, Charleston and the Navy have been inseparable, working together for the good of the low country and the defense of the nation. As we all know, that strong and proud partnership has come to this unfortunate end. While each of us will feel a certain amount of sadness as the American flag is struck from over this installation for the last time, we can take solace in the fact that this property will continue to contribute to South Carolina. Through the efforts of local leaders, in conjunction with the leadership provided by the Redevelopment Authority, I have no doubt that this base will become a thriving part of the low country and an important part of the region's economic base. Unquestionably, Charleston will never be quite the same with the closure of our Navy, but we will remember with much fondness those who served here. As always, please do not hesitate to call upon us, me, if I ever may be of assistance to any of you as a United States Senator. With kindest regards and best wishes, sincerely, Strom Thurmond. Before I introduce the next speaker, I would just like to make a couple general announcements. First, if you haven't seen it, please pick up a copy of our disestablishment program. We are especially pleased and proud of this pamphlet. In it, you will find a short history of the shipyard accompanied by numerous pictures that have never before been published. We believe that this will become a treasure piece of memorabilia for each of you to years to come. A special thank goes to Mr. Palmer Olaf and Mr. Jim McNeil for their time and effort in putting this program together. It is absolutely beautiful. I'd also add we are providing a, an overhead picture of the shipyard and a picture of our last overhaul ship, the USS Sickleson. Please make sure you pick up a copy of that before you leave today. Second, tomorrow morning at 0900, there will be a brief ribbon cutting ceremony to open the new re refurbished Navy Mar Yard Museum on the USS Yorktown at Patriots Point. Everyone here is invited and please join us for that ribbon cutting. Folks, this reconstructed museum is just fantastic. It will truly be a fitting memorial to the men and women of this great shipyard. A significant number of our employees have put a lot of their time, sweat, and tears in this project. I know that you will all be as proud of it as I am. A special thanks to Admiral James Flatley of Patriots Point for giving us their support and allowing us the platform and the opportunity to construct such a museum. Uh, and additionally, I'd like to announce that this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, uh, all shipyard employees, past and present, may visit the museum free of charge. Again, uh, thanks to the cooperation of the Patriots Point. Uh, third, uh, we have still have a few remaining copies of Jim McNeil's Charleston Navy Yard picture history, and we will have those on sale at cost uh, here after the ceremony. This is a, probably the last opportunity to get a copy of this great uh, history book of the shipyard. Please take advantage of it. And last, from 1100 to 1300 today, the controlled industrial area, which is the waterfront portion of the shipyard, will be open to allow guests and past employees one last chance to walk through the waterfront portion of Charleston Naval Shipyard. I do hope that you will all take advantage of this special opportunity. What has made the shipyard the great institution it has become? It is not the cranes, it's the dry docks, the shops, or the Navy that made Charleston so special. It has been the men and women of Charleston that have toiled, sweated, and put their hearts in their work. I could talk about the shipyard all day, but to truly understand its real meaning, you need to hear from a person who grew up and lived the shipyard. It is my pleasure to introduce one such individual. Robert Bob Chevery served the United States government for over 36 years. After serving four years in the Navy, he entered Charleston Naval Shipyard in September 1955 as an apprentice pipe fitter. Bob's impressive career at Charleston was marked by rapid progression and increased responsibility. In July 1973, he was selected as Shipyard Production Superintendent Pipe Fitter. Bob reached a pinnacle in December 84 
when he assumed the position of shipyard production superintendent, Mechanical Group. He guided the shipyard to several highly successful CFC campaigns and served as president of the National Association of Superintendents of Naval Shore Establishments. Bob is a recipient of numerous commendations and awards, including the Meritorious Civilian Service Award. His distinguished career at Charleston Naval Shipyard was completed upon his retirement in December 1988. It's a pleasure to have him back today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Chevery to reflect on Charleston Naval Shipyard. Thank you, Captain Hall. Good morning. Thank you, Captain Hall, for that introduction. Admiral DeMars, <coughs> Lieutenant Governor Peeler, Secretary Cassidy, and other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, fellow shipyarders. As always, it's good to be in familiar surroundings among friends. Like most of you, I'm sure, I stand here today with extreme mixed emotions. On the one hand, I am filled with pride and satisfaction in what this great shipyard of ours has done and been a, has, has accomplished, and what it has meant to us as individuals, our city, our state, our country, and the free world. But on the other hand, I am extremely saddened by the real fact that the shipyard as we know it will no longer exist. But if we allow ourselves to dwell on that negative aspect of today's ceremony, then it will overshadow many of the significant accomplishments that our shipyard has been responsible for. With the exception of a short four-year hitch in the Navy, <clears throat> this shipyard has been practically my entire adult life. It taught me a trade, educated me, paid me well, and allowed me to take care of myself and my family in excellent fashion. I learned many things while here in the shipyard. It taught me a trade, educated me, but the most important thing I learned was the people and the unique type of people that it takes to make a successful shipyard. I learned that the shipyard is not just the buildings, the piers, the docks that make up the facility, but like the church, the shipyard is its people. It's the people that build, inhabit, and toil in the buildings, the shops, and the docks. Most of you and all of those former shipyarders, military and civilian alike, that came before us sweat many hours of blood, sweat, and tears in one of the most demanding industrial environments known to man. Shipbuilding and ship repair is very unforgiving work. It leaves little to no room for error. It is not only physically, but also very technically and administratively demanding brought on not only by the uniqueness of the product, but also by the, uh, by, by the special demands of war and conflict. From its very inception, right up to and including the final closure process, this shipyard has performed exceptionally well. Why? Because of the people and the people relationships that have always existed here. There has always been a strong sense of personal pride and pride in accomplishment. Being a naval shipyard by a shipyard makes it even more unique in that the military members of our shipyard have not had the luxury of spending their entire careers here as most of our civilians have, or most of us civilians have. In many instances, they would come aboard right in the middle of various projects and have to spend an enormous amount of time and energy to get up to speed, and then, as they would say, hit the decks running. Then only, in most instances, to be reassigned right in the middle of a project that they may have birthed or brought from the cradle, and not enjoy the fruits of their labor or see the end results. Again, in many instances, to be reassigned in the same type of situation over and over again. So to say that a good civilian-military relationship is important to the success of the shipyard would be a tremendous understatement. It has been my experience, and certainly it is obvious from the many successes that this shipyard has enjoyed, 
that this shipyard not only has had a good civilian military relationship, but most probably the best in the business. These types of people relationships is a common thread that transcends all generations of Charleston Naval Shipyarders. Of all the very real physical financial and financial advantages that this shipyard has provided me with over the years, that which I cherish the most and will always have with me are the personal relationships and the friendships that will last forever. The strong work ethic, professionalism, loyalty, and dedication to duty that is passed down from generation to generation of shipyard people will continue to live on through our children and our grandchildren who will inhabit and toil in the same fine buildings, shops, docks, and piers. And they will continue to be successful regardless of the product or what the designation of the facility may end up being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. We are very fortunate that Rear Admiral Edward McKinley, Vice Commander, Naval Sea Systems Command, has been one of Charleston Naval Shipyard's bosses for the past two years. Having been a shipyard commander himself at Norfolk Naval Shipyard and having served at Mare Island and here at Charleston as a branch head, repair officer, and production officer, Admiral McGinley truly understands the shipyard business and what it takes to do it right. His 35-year Navy career has been focused on service to the fleet, first as a submarine officer, then as an engineering duty officer. His assignments as a flag officer have included command of the Naval Surface Warfare Center and as a maintenance officer for the Commander-in-Chief U.S. Pacific Fleet, where he was in charge of upkeep, repair, and modernization for all fleet ships, submarines, and aircraft. These past two years, as Vice Commander of NAVC, Admiral McGinley has been instrumental in steering NAVC through its restructuring to meet the Navy of the future. I consider Admiral McGinley a close personal friend and am grateful for his counsel, his continuing commitment to our people, and his presence here today. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in welcoming Rear Admiral Edward S. McGinley II, United States Navy. Let me adjust this to correct height here. Thanks a lot, Bill. Appreciate the very kind introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm, it uh, goes without saying that I'm really pleased to uh, be able to join you today in this uh, most important occasion. My uh, principal purpose here is to introduce our guest speaker, Admiral DeMars. But with your indulgence, I'd like just to take a few moments to reflect on my memories of some really wonderful years here at Charleston Naval Shipyard. I suppose that the many of you who spent all or a portion of your lives here, like, like you, my wife Connie and I have been uh, the victims of a little bit of nostalgia, not just today, but in the days preceding. We spent uh, almost six years of our lives here back in the late 70s and early 80s. I first experienced the famous Charleston Naval Shipyard hospitality as a customer, as a repair officer on the USS Simon Lake, a submarine tender, which was an overhaul back here in 1977. We were fresh from tending uh, submarines over in Rota, Spain, and we were eventually uh, to head up to the SSBN site at the weapons station. Well, I liked it so much that I came back from the Simon Lake to work here for five very interesting and challenging years, during a time when the shipyard's reputation was rapidly growing. The people here at the shipyard were impressive, both in their knowledge and in their dedication. Anything I ever did since, I guess it was worthwhile, was probably largely learned through my work with you here at the shipyard. Many of you in the audience here are some of those people, including Bob Chevry. Connie and I will never forget your warmth, your friendship, and your professionalism. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. I know from firsthand experience that running a shipyard is a nonstop challenge. In the closure environment, the word challenge is a gross understatement. On behalf of my boss, Vice Admiral Sterner, and myself, I thank you, the people of the Charleston Naval Shipyard, for being the professionals that you really are. 
Today, the flag may be lowered here, but in your capable hands, it never touched the ground. And on this occasion, your shipmates throughout NAVSEA salute you. And now I'm privileged and honored to introduce our principal speaker, Admiral Bruce DeMars. His naval career spans more than 42 years. In 1954, when a young man from Chicago named Bruce DeMars was in his plebe year at the Naval Academy, the Navy entered a new era when it launched the first nuclear-powered submarine, the Nautilus. His naval career encompasses extensive sea service aboard two surface ships, a diesel-electric submarine, and four nuclear-powered submarines, including command of the USS Kavala. His fleet experience also included command of Submarine Development Squadron 12 in the Atlantic Fleet, and as Commander Naval Forces Marianas and Commander Naval Base Guam in the Pacific Fleet. Prior to his current assignment, he served as a Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare. Long before assuming his current assignment in 1988, Admiral DeMars was well known for his high standards of operational excellence, material readiness, and a commitment to his people and their training. Whenever he has been physically based in Washington, his heart and his attention have remained focused squarely on the needs of the fleet. In his current assignment, Admiral Namars stands at the helm of a program which provides much of the power for our forward deployed Navy. As the third director of Naval Nuclear Propulsion, Admiral Namars brings to that position a critical fleet operator's perspective. He also provides the totally engaged leadership for a world-class program known for its pursuit and attainment of excellence. Clearly, it is a program envied by many and duplicated by none. It is particularly fitting that Admiral DeMars, who began his naval career just as the Navy entered the age of nuclear power, will be the senior officer embarked aboard the new Seawolf, SSN-21, during its sea trials at the dawn of another new era for our great Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Director of Naval Nuclear Propulsion, Admiral Bruce DeMars. Thank you very much for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Had I known it was going to be that good, I'd have given you a few more minutes of my time. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Peeler, Congressman Sanford, Mayor Summey, Assistant Secretary Cassidy, General Westmoreland, Captain Old, Mr. Chevery, honored guests and friends of Charleston Naval Shipyard, and most particularly the men and women who are working here today and have worked here in the past and their families. You really are the ones that I am talking to here today. I thank you all very much for asking me to be the final speaker before the shutdown closure, and I am truly honored. This is a bittersweet event at best, uh, full of strong memories, acceptance of the inevitable, and hope for the future compounded by the difficulty of capturing adequately over nine decades of service in a relatively brief ceremony. Service performed by the workers at this shipyard spanned a period of great change for the Navy and for the country, encompassing two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and the long Cold War. While to some, at some times, I may look old enough to speak on all of these matters from firsthand knowledge, let me confine my remarks to the recent history of this yard since its entry into the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. When Charleston Naval Shipyard began work in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, Admiral Arleigh Burke was the chief of naval operations, Captain Old was in the fifth grade, Lieutenant Governor Peeler was in the second grade, Alaska and Hawaii had been states for just one year. The Berlin Wall had not yet been built, but we were clearly well into the long Cold War. There were only 11 commissioned nuclear-powered submarines. Ballistic missile submarines had not yet started. There are patrols, deterrent patrols. And there were six private and two public shipyards constructing nuclear-powered vessels. How times have changed. Under the driving imperative of the Cold War, the nation geared up to defend freedom throughout the world. The story of the 
submarine force in the Navy in the Cold War is one of an immense undersea technology race, a race as yet inadequately chronicled. The specifics are impressive and interesting. Our earlier nuclear submarines were not sound quieted. There was no tactical reason. And as many people here know, the design, construction, and repair were daunting enough without this dimension. Today, our nuclear-powered submarines are as quiet as diesel-electric submarines running on the battery. Our earlier nuclear submarines had sonars because submarines are supposed to have sonars. But they provided very little tactical intelligence. Targets were routinely seen through the periscope long before they were heard. Today, the passive and active sonar systems are truly awesome, providing tactical intelligence from vast distances. Weapons have advanced from straight-running torpedoes with a few mile range and an acoustic torpedo that rarely heard the target to today's high-speed, long-range, heavyweight, wire-guided torpedo with a sonar better than most diesel submarines and the amazing Tomahawk missile, which can fly 1,000 miles and land inside a baseball diamond. As you can see from the very fine program, the workers here at Charleston Naval Shipyard were a key part in this exciting, demanding, undersea technology race. Shipyard work is hard work. It is physically demanding work. It is cramped with never enough space for the work and always there are several other trades working in the allotted space. All the accesses are filled with electrical cables, ventilation ducting, hosing, and the like, leaving very little room to squeeze past. There are lots of sharp corners, and everything always seems to be freshly painted. It is either too hot or too cold. I have a number of khaki work uniforms at home that bear souvenirs from Charleston Naval Shipyard. This is the first time I've ever worn my dress blues in the shipyard, and I just know something's going to happen to them today. It is mentally demanding work. You regularly deal with radiation, high-pressure air, high-pressure hydraulics, high-voltage electrical systems. When components or systems are open for repair, routinely there are surprises, and the work must be re-engineered. Nuclear-powered submarine is the most complicated warfighting platform in this country's arsenal. And the repair demands the sharpest mechanics, technicians, and engineers in the country. Finally, it is psychologically demanding. A naval nuclear power program is of necessity founded on a high degree of personal responsibility. This requires the ability to admit error, face facts squarely, and seek the truth from mistakes. This, to a degree, contravenes human nature. And so, those workers who can perform productively in this environment are indeed a national asset, unfortunately too often taken for granted. It is no surprise, then, that service at Charleston Naval Shipyard on the waterfront or in support of the waterfront generates such intense pride esprit de corps and loyalty. Working in this environment, the Cold War contribution of the men and women at this shipyard was immense. There is an old saying that goes during war, amateurs talk of strategy, while professionals talk of logistics. Nowhere is this more appropriate than this shipyard's support of nuclear submarines throughout the Cold War. During the Cold War, the Soviets lagged behind as we built successive classes of ever more capable submarines. Skate, Skipjack, Permit, Sturgeon, Los Angeles, Polaris, Poseidon, Trident. Soviets built over twice as many different classes of nuclear submarines in the same period. But ours continued to outperform theirs, due in no small measure to the maintenance and logistic support from Charleston Naval Shipyard. We countered their every move. As they got quieter, we invented a tow to ray sonar and changed our tactics. When they went deeper and faster to compensate for their lack of stealth, we modified our torpedoes to go deeper and faster and let them know we did it. When they deployed to the Mediterranean in the 60s, we followed. When they went to the Indian Ocean in the 70s, 
we followed. When they went under the Arctic ice pack to escape detection, we increased our Arctic deployments from one sub per year to three to four per year. Soviets made their submarine force the centerpiece of their post-World War II naval expansion, and we hounded them unmercifully. They always came out second best. Our submarine program was one of the country's most successful Cold War competitive strategies. Reacting to the pressure of our strategic and attack submarines, the Soviets had to commit vast resources in the pursuit of undersea superiority. This unrelenting pressure literally drove them to the poorhouse and was instrumental in the collapse of the Soviet system and victory in the Cold War. While I have fallen into the amateur's trap of discussing tactics and strategy, that only forms a backdrop to the daunting maintenance and logistic efforts to support a force of nuclear submarines that at its peak numbered 137. The effort to refuel, repair, represerve, sound quiet, and modernize this fleet, whose time offline was at a premium, was an immense challenge. This challenge was compounded by the need for worldwide maintenance sites. Holy Lock, Rota, Guam, La Madalena, Naha, to name a few. Skilled workers from Charleston Naval Shipyard were routinely dispatched overseas and on both coasts of this country. While the Soviets had physicists, metallurgists, and scientists that rivaled our country, they never came close to developing the equal of our skilled mechanics, technicians, and waterfront engineers. And it was a prime factor in the ultimate implosion of their system. Every Charles Naval Shipyard worker, past and present, can take pride in their skilled contribution to this victory. This dedication to duty and sense of personal responsibility has continued throughout the last 31 months of closure activities. Not surprising when you understand what really makes the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program what it is. Captain Old, I thank you and your senior managers for your strong leadership during this very difficult period. The closeout of the nuclear aspects has been a daunting endeavor. We have done radiological work here for over three decades. Our goal was to turn all our activities over with no restrictions on subsequent use, as if we had never been here. There was much to do, over 150 buildings, 14 piers, six dry docks. I'm most proud of the results. The total area survey that is checking for radioactivity was the equivalent of 115 football fields. The total area requiring remediation, that is removal of radioactivity, was the equivalent of only one football field and only between a goal line and the 16 yard line that is inside the red zone for most of you Panther fans. Equally impressive is the amount of radioactivity that required cleaning up. About as much as that contained in one smoke detector such as you have in your home. These statistics speak volumes for the responsible stewardship exercised by the workers at this shipyard for three and a half decades. All of our survey efforts have been agreed to and overchecked by the state, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Restoration Advisory Board. I take this opportunity to thank these groups for their professional approach to this difficult endeavor. Lieutenant Governor Peeler, it is also time that I thank you for the good relations that the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program has enjoyed over the years with the state of South Carolina. We have always been able to deal in a straightforward manner with the Division of Radioactive Waste Management and the Bureau of Radiological Health. While we have not always agreed, that is not to be expected in matters of such consequence, the resolution was always acceptable to both sides. The ability to frankly discuss potentially sensitive matters on a professional, technical level, divorced from concern for perceptions and appearances is truly appreciated. 
and I must say, unfortunately, somewhat unique to South Carolina. I'm happy that the program will continue to have a presence in this fine state by virtue of our training facilities across the river at the weapons station. Thank you very much. We like it here. I'm not unaware of the personal impact occasioned by the closure of this wonderful shipyard that has for so long played a vital role in generations of families. The Navy, within its capability, has attempted to mitigate this impact. Over 1,500 workers were priority placed in other government positions. 1,000 workers accepted separation incentives to depart. Over 16,000 hours of formal training was conducted to increase the capability of departing workers. And over 2,600 workers took advantage of tuition reimbursable courses. All these actions totaled over some $55 million of effort. On a recent tour through a Trident submarine at Kings Bay, Georgia, under repair at the time, a senior mechanic came up to me and thanked me on behalf of his family for finding him a job at his, in his field at Kings Bay when he had to leave the shipyard. I accepted those thanks on the behalf of many people in the Navy, including those on the platform behind me, who used every means available to try and soften this blow. I wish we could have done more. And so let me close by saying we are here today to witness the end of an era in the Low Country. Let us all use this occasion to think on and applaud the men and women whose service at this shipyard during a most historic period was of great advantage to the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral DeMars, for those comments. I will now read the disestablishment order from Commander Naval Sea Systems Command to Commander Charleston Naval Shipyard, subject operational closure of Charleston Naval Shipyard. By direction of the Secretary of the Navy, as recommended by the Defense Space Closure and Realignment Commission and approved by the President of the United States, Charleston Naval Shipyard will complete operational closure not later than 1 April 1996 and transfer claimancy of all real and personal property to the Naval Facilities Engineering Command. After 95 years of service, Charleston Naval Shipyard's record of accomplishments will remain as part of the honored history of the Navy. The Navy is grateful to every man and woman, past and present, for their part in this history. Signed, George R. Sterner, Vice Admiral, United States Navy. Will the guests please rise for the lowering of the colors over Charleston Naval Shipyard. <clears throat> Shipyard color detail, post. Captain Easton, haul down the colors. Haul down the colors, aye, sir. Shipyard color detail. Haul down the colors.
McKinley, Charleston Naval Shipyard, his boat. Mr. Raymond Roberts will receive the flag on behalf of all shipyard workers, past and present. This flag will be placed in the museum on board the carrier Yorktown at Patriots Point. Mr. Roberts placed this flag at the Navy Yard Museum on the USS Yorktown. Ladies and gentlemen, Charleston Naval Shipyard is closed. Would you all please join me in one final round of applause for the men and women of Charleston Naval Shipyard, past and present. Thank you. Will the guests please be seated? Rear Admiral E.L. Watkins III, Commander, Naval Base Charleston. What a wonderful ceremony. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it certainly is a pleasure to be here with you this morning to be able to commemorate the service of those fine shipyard folks and the folks who served at the Naval Station Naval Base here in Charleston. Thank you to all of the present and former Charleston Naval Shipyard workers for sharing this day with us. You truly honor us for being here. You are today's very important persons. Thank you for your years of dedication and pride. Today we also celebrate the valiant efforts of reuse occurring at this base and around the Low Country. It's appropriate on this day that we note with pride the outstanding teamwork and cooperation that has gone into transitioning the Naval Shipyard and Naval Base into civilian work. For months now, a diverse group of people has focused its time and talents on organizing, planning, and implementing civilian reuse of the base. The redevelopment effort, redevelopment authority, now under the tutelage of Jim Bryant, and guided day to day by Jack Sprott are bringing real reuse to the base. Thank you. The level of energy and commitment is extraordinary. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has been involved in this successful effort, particularly the Navy and the Naval civilian employees, the civilian, uh, the Charleston Naval Complex Redevelopment Authority, and the other many community and business leaders that have been instrumental in this effort. It's my distinct honor today, however, to introduce one of the key players who provides valuable support to the base transition from the Navy side. Mr. William J. Cassidy, Jr., the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Conversion and Redevelopment, fulfills a vital yet largely behind-the-scenes role. Whenever bureaucratic obstacles threaten to interrupt timely reuse or, or lease of base property to reusers, Mr. Cassidy is called and he intervenes in order to assure that the process is successful. He's the point man for all Navy and civilian efforts in redeveloping naval bases in Charleston and across the country. He brings a rich background and many talents to his position. Mr. Cassidy received his Bachelor of Arts degree cum laude from Georgetown University in 1968. In 1969, he joined the Navy and served on board the USS Robert H. McCard, the DD-822, right here in Charleston. His three-year tour as deck division officer, gunnery officer, and communications officer made him familiar with the great bonds between the Navy 
and this community here in Charleston. In 1972, he resigned his commission and attended law school at Georgetown University when he graduated in 1974. Mr. Cassidy went on to serve as a U.S. District Law Clerk, then an Assistant uh, U.S. Attorney General for the District of Columbia, and then went into private practice in 1979. He was appointed to his present position in 1994. Mr. Cassidy is truly a friend and a friend of Charleston. He has helped the reuse efforts every step of the way. Please join me in giving a warm, low country welcome to the Secretary, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Admiral. Lieutenant Governor Peeler, Congressman Sanford, Mayor Summey, General Westmoreland, Admiral DeMars, Admiral McGinley, Admiral Watkins, Captain Nold, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us as we mark the closure of Charleston Naval Shipyard and also reflect on the closure of Naval Station Charleston. And I want particularly to recognize the men and women who worked long and hard at both the Naval Shipyard and the Naval Station and who have joined us for this ceremony. They deserve our most sincere thanks. I particularly want to recognize all of you who worked here uh, during World War II to reflect on the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, which has just concluded. At the outset, I want you to know that it is, it is difficult, even painful, to close these magnificent assets. 25 years ago, I sailed from this base on USS Robert H. McCard, one of the many destroyers that filled Pier Papa and Pier Quebec in those days. I sailed down the Cooper River, past Fort Sumter, to buoy to Charlie, and beyond. And all of those ventures were successful largely due to the hard work of the shipyard, which kept those very old destroyers going. And I know you know how hard that was to do. And for all those of you who are Charlestonians, I want you to know that upon each return, the spires of Charleston's churches were a very welcome sight. Our bases and shipyards across the country have served the nation so well for so long that they have become part of the social fabric of our country and of the local communities that serve as hosts for our ships and our aircraft. All of the many sailors from all across this country who served here in Charleston, as I did, will always remember Charleston in the same way that they remember their hometowns, because Charleston truly was a home port. Ladies and gentlemen, these are difficult endeavors that we are engaged in. In 1993, we closed the naval station Puget Sound in Seattle, Washington, which supplied American forces in the Aleutian Islands during World War II. We closed the Naval Air Facility at Midway Island in the Pacific Ocean, site of the famous World War II battle. We closed the Naval Air Station at Glenview, Illinois, outside Chicago, where naval aviators during World War II, including President Bush and President Ford, trained. And we closed the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard and Naval Station, where the first ships of the line were built 200 years ago, and where in the post-Cold War era, modern aircraft carriers were overhauled and had their lives, their service lives, extended. In 1996 and 1997, we will close Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo, California, just north of San Francisco, where nuclear submarines were overhauled just as they were here. We will close Naval Station Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay. We will close Naval Air Station Alameda and the Naval Aviation Depot in Alameda across the Oakland Bay Bridge from the city of San Francisco. When we close Naval Air Station Alameda in the near future, we will close a base where aircraft carriers sail to the Pacific, the South China Sea, and the Gulf of Tonkin. And today we mark the closure of Charleston Naval Shipyard and reflect on the closure of the Naval Station, home port to destroyers and minesweepers and submarines of the United States Atlantic Fleet. The mere mention of these names evokes not only personal memories of the places where many of us lived and worked and served,
but also the history of our nation in the 20th century. So it is hard for all of us engaged in this process, very hard, to make this transition without emotion. But the world has changed, not as completely as we would like, and not so much that it is not still a dangerous place, but enough that we must adjust our force levels and correspondingly our shore-based infrastructure of naval stations and naval bases and naval shipyards to accommodate the resources that are available to us as we compete with other national demands. When I served here in the 1960s, we had 900 ships in the United States Navy. In 1985, with the Cold War force at its peak, we had 545 battle force ships, destroyers and frigates and cruisers and submarines. By 1991, under President Bush, the number of our battle force ships had declined from 545 to 425 combatants. Today, under President Clinton, we have 363 ships, more than half of which are underway today in the defense of our nation. At the same time that we have less ships and less aircraft, we had an infrastructure that was designed and built to support Cold War force levels. So we had to reduce the infrastructure to make it proportional to the size of our forces. And today's closure is part of that effort. So today, the United States Navy has set a new course for Charleston Naval Shipyard and for the Naval Station, one which we hope will bring prosperity and enhance the lives of all who live in South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no greater contribution that any community can make to its country than to provide a home for those who dedicate their lives to the defense of our nation. And so, on behalf of the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, and the Secretary of the Navy, John Dalton, I want to thank you for sharing the rich traditions and history of the Low Country with our sailors, and for making us feel at home, and for supporting and maintaining our ships and making them ready to defend our nation for so long. For your warmth, your generosity, and your kind spirit, the United States Navy will be forever grateful. We were honored to call Charleston home, and we will always think of the Cooper River as a home port for the United States Navy. And I hope you will not forget us, because in times of peril, which surely will come, American warships and naval aircraft will be there. And the men and women who serve on those ships and in those aircraft will need your thoughts and your prayers and your support. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to present a symbolic key to the naval base at Charleston to the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina, Lieutenant Governor Peeler. On behalf of the Department of the Navy, the United States Navy, and everyone here, I present this key to the naval complex to the state of South Carolina, and we wish you the best of luck in the future with this great asset, and we will stand behind you and support you to the maximum extent that we can. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. On behalf of the state of South Carolina and the people of South Carolina, let me say thank you to everyone with the Navy who has helped to make today's transition as painless as possible. It would have been a lot simpler for you to have packed up and pulled out without ever looking back. But you didn't do that. And the people of South Carolina are forever grateful. There's really no way to put in perspective the Navy's contribution to the Charleston area, to the people of South Carolina, and our nation's proud defense. They are as innumerable as they are indelible. And truly, they speak for themselves. And yet still, there's no escaping the fact that today is a sad day. It's as if two old good friends are parting ways after a lifetime of dedicated friendship, each embarking upon a new path, each embracing a distinctly different destiny. 
And as we take these few fleeting moments of time to ponder the legacy of this grand old shipyard and the men and women who knew it, we must recognize that with this solemn parting of ways comes a waking dawn of opportunity. Today is a day to remember, but it is also a day to look forward, to move on, and to greet the future with open arms. Together, the Navy, the Redevelopment Authority, and the state of South Carolina have begun to sow a new generation of economic prosperity for Charleston and the Low Country. Already, there are 20 reusers employing 1,600 people on the base. CMMC currently has two ships in its docks under repair. Charleston Shipbuilding is preparing to assemble electric power plants on old warships. And the Babcock Wilcox is keeping low country dollars in the low country by manufacturing precision machine parts for area companies who previously looked beyond South Carolina's borders for business. Together, these 20 reusers are expected to employ more than 8,000 people within the next five years. And that's just the beginning. I've been informed by the RDA that eight other leases are currently under negotiation. And I feel certain that it won't be long before our present tenants have new neighbors. This incredible transformation would not be possible were it not for the cooperation of the Navy. So as we usher in the new dawn of a promising new era, let us take pause. Let us take pause to once again give thanks and bid an old true friend a fond farewell. On behalf of the state of South Carolina, to everyone with the Charleston Naval Shipyard and the United States Navy, I thank you. And for everything, may God bless you. Will the guests please rise for the benediction? Let us pray. Almighty God, you spoke and the depths of the sea came into being. According to your plan for creation, you formed human beings out of the dust of the earth and breathed into them the breath of life. Those very beings set their sights on the great oceans of the world, and when in distress, they lifted up a perilous cry. You heard them and answered. By your hand, you calmed the tempest high waves and hushed the storm to a whisper. With your guidance, hundreds of ships have been led into this safe haven. For the men and women who have built and restored vessels of freedom, hope, and peace, we are eternally grateful. Oh God, help us to never forget their contribution to liberty. Bless now, we pray, everyone present in the path laid before each. For it is in the name of the one true God we pray. Amen. Retire the colors.
Ladies and gentlemen, will the guests please remain standing until after the official party departs. This concludes the ceremony. All guests are cordially invited to the reception to be held in the shipyard park adjacent to the ceremony area. The shipyard industrial area be open for visiting.